You're watching News Feed AM. Let's uh, continue the conversation now on our coverage of the start of the 2024 academic year across the country. We now shine the spotlight on the state of education in the Eastern Cape province. Over the years, the province has faced a number of challenges, such as overcrowded classes, a shortage of teachers, including a poor infrastructure. These are just uh, some of the few issues opposition parties in that province uh, such as the democratic alliance action sa also sounding the alarm over the poor state of affairs in the province when it comes to education so the man in charge of education in the eastern cape is fundi legade the mec he's in studio with me today mec good morning to you good morning to you Claudia, and the listeners i've got to tell you i feel very privileged to have you here on the first day of schooling and you've decided to come to Newsroom Africa. Let's talk about day one of schooling in the Eastern Cape, specifically the issue of placement. The MEC, rather the Minister of Basic Education, Enjo Motecha, saying this morning, there are some 21,000 children across the country who have yet to be placed. How many of those account for your province? Uh, look, thanks uh, for the opportunity. We have been able to first and foremost uh, deal with the crisis of uh, admissions in the province. Mm. Uh, in the previous years, it has always been Nelson Mandela District, uh, Port Elizabeth to be precise, uh, Buffalo City, um, Amtata and a bit of Alwal North. Mm. The reason is because of the migration uh, to those areas uh, in the past. What we have done is to provide 213 classrooms yeah. in the province, in particular in the blind spots that I have just lifted it now. Currently, we are about uh, 255 learners that are being engaged. But from the previous, from the previous admissions, as we closed them in November, we were at zero. But precisely because we have got this crisis of migration, people are coming back to the province. So we had to open up the admissions back again um, so that no one is left behind mm. in terms of the system. So the system is going very well. And, uh, and I can assure you by, by, by Friday, there will be no student or a learner in the province that has not been accommodated in terms of the data that is before us uh, from the district directors. Yeah. MEC, we have a lot of issues to yes. discuss. So you and I are going to have to pace ourselves here. Let's talk about budget cuts that were announced by National Treasury some time ago. How has your province been affected by these budget cuts? And the reason I ask that question has to do with 70% at least that's my understanding. 70% of your schools in the Eastern Cape are no-fee paying schools, schools, which places a huge reliance on your part on the national fiscus. So with these budget cuts, how have you been affected? Of course, we have been affected fully. Um, uh, Treasury has taken about $207 million. Sure. Um, from the fiscus of the province, in particular in education. But um, we strategically look into the budget allocations uh, as a province, as a, as a department to be precise. And we then said, no, what we cannot afford is to drop the school funding norms mm. because of exactly what you are talking about. Because our schools are predominantly quintile one, two, three. Mm. which comes from the destitute families. So you must just provide 1,600 per learner at all cost. We then decided to take that 207 million from infrastructure instead, mm. and, uh, which of course now has created a bit of a sluggish problem because we are at 87% spending. So we might, we, might, we might have an overspending come the end of the financial year in terms of the infrastructure budget. Mm -hmm. So we were then uh, planning of talking to the provincial treasurer to either receive that money back or DPE in terms of the performance of infrastructure in other provinces. Yeah. Get it back uh, so that we can pay our dues because there are projects that are currently underway 
and, and then such we might have a problem in terms of the end of the financial year. Can I quickly get clarity? So you're saying per Lena there is a budget of a thousand rand. Is that monthly or annually? H how far does this thousand rand stretch to that one learner? In terms of the policy, in terms of the national standards, a, a learner is supposed to get 1,600 rands per, per annum um, as, as, as a subsidy uh, for them to be able to run the no fee school mm. so that you can cushion uh, the destitute families from fee paying. Um, but, but that does not change the fact that government subsidizes other aspects like your learner support material, your school, your school nutrition and other related matters, yeah. just to make the school function. So on that aspect, we were then arrogantly saying we are not going to compromise on it. Let's make sure that our schools and Section 21 schools are getting their monies uh, through the trenches that we have. You've already mentioned that you have had to rob the infrastructure budget in yes. order to fund some of what we are talking about, funding uh, pupils who come from uh, poor households. But that does not take away the desperation of your province to build more schools. How many have you built in this uh, past financial year, or should we say 2023, and how many more schools are needed in the Eastern Cape? We have gone a long way uh, to deal with the infrastructure backlog that we have in the province. We have succeeded in completing 41 schools, mm. uh, with eight uh, replacement schools and three new schools, absolutely new, precisely because we are restructuring uh, the schooling system in the province. Mm. Um, we have dealt with the abortion facility of uh, 1142 that is 1,142 schools, mm. to deal with the eradication of pit Latins in that space. Because remember, we have got that background, that bad background of dilapidated toilets and pit Latins in the province. Yeah. So at least um, we have moved a bit faster this time around. And uh, I can assure you, uh, in a space of uh, eight months to come, um, the issue of backlogs will be a history in the province. Let's talk about these budget constraints on hiring of appropriately qualified teachers. Again, I'm going to repeat that we were pressed for time, so I'm going to try and uh, justify my questions. The reason I'm asking you about the hiring of teachers within a constrained financial environment has to do in part with what is being predicted and that is that in the next 10 years experts are saying that half of South Africa's teachers will retire leaving a massive gap in the education sector. What's your planning around this? That's a quite a very good question. We have diversified uh, our HRD strategy, um, looking on the how best uh, do we change even the curriculum itself of the province and look into the offerings of the universities that are around the space, pro engineering uh, new educators for us in that space. We are a math and science province in the first place, mm -hmm. predominantly. So we then focus in investing uh, in the universities in ensuring that we populate more educators coming from that space so that we can respond to the provincial development plan and the national development plan because remember we are a skills um, sector yeah. so the skill of the country depends on the basic education uh, so that's, 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 that's the plan that we have um, yes of course from time to time we are closing up the vacancies uh, as one comes out in terms of retirement, then placement are done, and also also look into the walk-ins, yeah. yeah, so that the recruitment plan does not uh, make the kids suffer a bit along. But let me see the quality of those teachers that are being brought into the system. That is of paramount importance, particularly for a province like yours, 
specific locations are going to need those appropriately qualified teachers. I'm glad you mentioned maths and science. That's a strength. But what is the quality of the people that are being brought in to teach those very subjects? Yeah, the quality, of course, is improving day by day by day, uh, totally, because um, we, you rely solely on how the, deep, uh, the Department of Higher Education has positioned itself uh, in terms of the HRD strategy of the country. And what are these elements that must be achieved from an economic point of view? Yeah. But basically, we have been able to knock sense with the vice chancellors um, that are in that space, for example, uh, Usu, Fortin Roads, just to look into the quality of educators that are coming from them to our own space, um, so as to at least cushion um, the rural nature of the province that we are, but also a competitive system. Uh, because remember, whether you are rural or urban, uh, the education system is competitive. Yeah. Need to deal with the fundamentals that are there. Let me see. Uh, I am very desperate to move on, but I would be doing a huge injustice if we don't talk about infrastructure backlogs. Yes, we've touched on it, but when it comes to the building of bridges, for example, for pupils who have to cross rivers to get yes. to school. Just moments ago, we were showing visuals in Guazulu Natal. Yes, it's not your province, but it's also a highly rural province, which means that you have many of these pupils who have to do that dangerous walking long distance to get to school. Transport, scholar transport. Address us on that and where things are. Only the, the provincial government have taken a very progressive decision um, to take all the roads, uh, both the provincial and local one, to Sandra. Hmm. And um, the budget that were given by the national um, treasury has been given to treasurer to deal with that. The well, the well seas were bridges, uh, about 48 of them, that are currently built in the province. So I'm, I'm saying um, out of the desperation um, of how do you link the access of education into the road network uh, infrastructure becomes critical mm. uh, because of us being part of the stormy areas uh, and as such having some disasters. By November last year we have some disasters by the way. Mm. And some schools have been affected. And therefore that poses a threat in terms of the school readiness as we speak. Mm. But however we have dealt with it in terms of the mo modular classes so that you can cushion whatever crisis that is there. But for me uh, what was a, a bit of a, a worry now is the violence coming from Port St. John's area on the basis of the fight between the taxi industry, mm -hmm. which poses a threat uh, for the reopening of the school, about 40, 40 of them, mm -hmm. uh, because of the route between Port St. John's, Lusikisiki, and Flagstaff. Yeah. yeah. We're going to conclude the conversation with uh, the, the metric results that are anticipated uh, tomorrow. There is one specific school, MSC, that I need to draw your attention to, and it's a, it's a special needs school, Ikwez Logusa, yes. Sexual predators have had unfettered access to that school. This is a school that caters for children who are disabled. Here are these people who are known sexual predators, having access to such children, vulnerable children. You've dealt with that matter poorly. Do you agree? Yes, yes, I agree. I agree. I agree. Firstly, the problem we have earlier on was the ownership of the school um, because it belongs to a church, uh, not government. But however, my attitude was that, look, whether the ownership is a problem, remember, there are kids there which must be secured by government. And however, also we must then deal 
with our internal incapacity in dealing with the behavior and conduct of our own employees in that particular space mm -hmm. and that has been dealt with now when you say it has been dealt with what has happened to the known sexual predators who have been preying on these children who are not, helpless not they are, they are subjected into disciplinary processes and the HOT is supposed to be finalizing the that process um, at the end of this January in terms of the schedules that they gave it to me so, so let me press you a little bit those that are going through a disciplinary process are they still going to the school no they were suspended immediately immediately we deal to we dealt with the investigations mm. uh, they were suspended the ones that uh, the report was indicating mm. and um, and also the district offers us some few uh, people that can be of assistance in ensuring that the school is not vulnerable uh, in terms of provisioning of the service, albeit the fact that you have got those ones. Because remember, Koli, uh, the inclusive education is a sensitive sector. Mm. So you can't allow anyone to either abuse them. Uh, it's a quite a very sensitive one in terms of the white paper six. So that's why we took that decision with the HOT to say, look, we, we can't wait uh, and we can't rely on the justice system we've got our own internal code of conduct here exactly that we must deal with it MEC I'm glad but you see you, you can talk strongly here but when it comes to the care of those children it takes time yes. just as the team from the broadcast house that really has brought this school to the national to the nation's attention I should say Yes. Carte Blanche has done a fantastic job of that, uh, bringing the attention of that uh, school to the public. What accountability, MEC, do you take as the custodian of education in the Eastern Cape for vulnerable children, disabled children, to be abused in that manner by people who are supposed to care for them? Someone should have been fired already. Yes, the, that's why I'm saying we, we, we have taken the responsibility and, uh, and, and of course we have tried our level best to ensure that we stabilize uh, the institution, mm -hmm. changing the top management by the way of that school and uh, bringing an administrator uh, outside so that you can be able whilst to deal with the infrastructure issues that were raised by the, by the people from Teleplanche but also deal with your internal capacity mm. in terms of the school management and governance uh, so that you don't uh, found wanting. Hence I'm saying it's a matter that, um, that, that has got an attention of the HOT yeah. and an attention of myself now has been elevated from the district with me and the HOT. All right, let me see. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, I'm pressed for time, so I'm going to take a quick break. Once we come back, we're going to wrap up this conversation because I know that there is the question of uh, uh, the metric pass rate, yes. specifically Eastern Cape. You seem to be very competitive in that space. And we're going to discuss whether or not it is good competition. Okay. I'll explain why in a moment. You're watching News Feed AM. If you're just joining us, you find us at the tail end of a conversation with the Eastern Cape Education MEC Fundi Legate who is in studio with me today. MEC, let's conclude the conversation. The metric pass rate. Eastern Cape, it seems to be coming up steadily. Having been one of those provinces that were really uh, doing badly last year, you obtained a 77 pass rate, metric pass rate, and that placed you at number six at national level. I'm told that there is a new ambition that you hold. Where do you think you will drive that pass mark or pass rate of 77% in the class of 2023? Yes, yes, of course we are one of the biggest uh, schooling system in the country after KZN and uh, Gauteng province. Mm. Um, but what is critical of us as a province is to reposition the province mm -hmm. and uh, look at the basics, uh, what makes us to be a competitive system. Mm -hmm. um, 
I can assure you we are going to be above 80%. That one is not a negotiable matter. All right. So let, let me just stop you there for a moment. So 80% pass rate is what you are telling us will probably be announced on the part of the Eastern Cape tomorrow when these results That one come I can up. assure you. 80% pass rate. 80% and that. above, not less. How do you think you've managed this? Look, when we joined the office in 2019, we developed a strategy on how best um, can we bring a culture, a different culture within the sector, mm -hmm. an accountability one uh, that moves from one teacher to another, from one school to another, from one district director to another, yeah. including the cohort of management that we have. But also look into the strategic uh, shortcomings of the system itself. Mm -hmm. What makes us to be um, at the tail end in the past uh, 15 years? And what are the blind spots in dealing with that? Uh, we then look um, into how best can we take at least 5% every academic year. And we have succeeded on that. So that's why I'm saying the issue of 80% is, 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 is not there. If you look in terms of the organic growth performance system of the province mm -hmm. since 2019. But there, there, is, there is something that is wrong with how this new system that you speak about is, is being driven. Apparently, the principals are taking extreme pressure to produce these results. And at some school, um, I think it was in the area of Flagstaff, if I'm not lying. Yes. A principal there took a very drastic step of telling parents that your child or your children are not performing based on the results uh, during the year and therefore it's no use that they sit for the final exam. Surely harsh punishment should have been visited upon that principle. Was that a right thing to do? No, no, no. It's, it's quite wrong. It's quite wrong. It's quite wrong because remember kids have got a right to education. Mm. That's the first point. But also the system must ask the system must be able to enable any citizenry to change their own livelihood via education, uh, schooling system. Mm. So that one has been taken quite very seriously um, by, the, by the head office and, uh, and, and also investigations have been always um, on, on, on the conclusion part of that. Mm -hmm. Precisely because of the pressure of the results cannot allow anyone to make kids vulnerable. Uh, so to speak. But our attitude as a province was to look into a triangular shape. Whilst you are looking into grade 12 um, as a barometer for the country, how do you arrive there? Is your system of the schooling in the country appreciate that this is a two-tie system from grade R to grade 7? If you talk the quality of the throughput, can you not get that quality on grade 7, not on grade 12? Mm -hmm. So that you offload the pressure of the FET band, the teachers of high school, in sleeping in schools. In essence, it means you must bring back the GETC certificate in grade 7, so that the performance system is holistically from grade R to grade 12. Explain that GECT system at grade 7 because the minister this morning spoke about introducing, in fact her words were piloting a new national exam in grade 9. Is that what you are referring to or is it something completely different? That's exactly what the minister is talking about because remember grade 8 and 9 is in the secondary system. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of the two-tie system that we have in the country. But my argument is that if you have mastered the art and skill of ensuring that 
uh, the foundation phase learning and also the grade 4 to grade 7 is up to scratch. You won't have that crisis of a competition unnecessarily making uh, principals uh, to be under duress of high schools because uh, that organic nature of the growth and development of the kids you have achieved at an earlier stage. So the minister is, has, has already piloted that. By the way, it has already started in the province, about 127 schools mm -hmm. that are doing um, a grade 9 uh, certification currently as we speak so that you are able to make sure that you don't just get kids progressing to another phase without a scientific evidence. With all these great plans, MEC, you have to have the buy-in of the unions that operate in the education space. How much buy-in is there from the biggest, which is SATU, NAPTOSA, all of these unions? Are they in agreement with what is planned, in fact, it's already being piloted, as the minister said, because they are the people who are going to implement this. If, if it doesn't have buy-in from them, you might as well kiss these new plans goodbye. When you, when, Cody, when you deal with people and deal about people too, you, you need some uh, personal skills. Uh, to deal with how the people perceive uh, the system itself. Mm. We have succeeded as a province uh, in ensuring that there is stability in the, in the, in the, in the system. Um, for the past four years, we have never had any strike in the province. And, uh, and two, the collaboration framework that we have introduced in the province, bringing everybody on board, is the one that can that, can, that is going to be at the, at the heart of what the minister is going to pronounce uh, tomorrow. Because those results do not belong to the sector. Yeah. They belong to the entire people of the province. Fundi Lekade, let me thank you very much for your time, sir. And indeed, uh, coming through to studio, it has been a worthwhile conversation. So an 80% pass mark is what uh, the MEC of the Eastern Cape is suggesting we might hear tomorrow when the metric results, or should we say the class of 2023, the pass rate there is announced.